once again guys, you're watching High Voltage Mayhem and today I want to bring you a part 2 video on a World War II transmitter we've been working on restoring back to operation. Now the reason this video took a while to get out there on the internet is because part of it got deleted due to some faulty solid state memory that I've been using here recently and we may even do a video on that. And I've also been very busy working on a World War II Navy ship. And I will tell you all about that. As a matter of fact, we're even moving this YouTube channel on board a World War II Destroyer Escort. And I will talk about that in a later video. But in the meantime, we have to talk about this BC-1335 and what we must do to get it going. So without further ado, let's take a look at the front panel and see what it has to offer. So when we take a look at the front panel of this radio, you can clearly see that the thing was built to be used on the move. Because this radio really is simple compared to the radios that we'll be taking a look at on this channel here in the near future. So right here we have a microphone input. So this is where the microphone would go for the radio. You know, and then that would go to the control grid of the tubes and all that to be amplified and sent out as radio waves. Now right here we have our phone's output. So this is a quarter inch jack. And that'll send our signal out to our external speaker or headphones, whatever you choose. And if we take a look on the inside, this is a spring-loaded latch and it locks in place. That's really convenient so we don't kill our cables. It's got O-rings right here. So you can see this is all rubber, and then it's got a rubber plug on there, which the rubber really is not all that bad. It's still flexible, so that means it might seal. But you can clearly see that they tried to make a waterproof attempt on these connectors. So when we close that, that spring then holds that in place, and hopefully will seal all the water out and moisture and keep stuff from getting into our phone jack. Now right here is a really simple switch. This is our channel selector or our frequency selector, except the frequency that you select is based on what you pre-program inside the radio. And I'll show you that function here in just a minute. And then we have our power, so you can see power on. And then we have our volume potentiometer right there, so basically variable resistance. And then we have our power input. So you can see that, again, they tried to waterproof everything because there's little O-rings and seals, rubber gaskets, inside of all of these pin sleeve connectors. And last but not least, there is our 6-volt and 12-volt power options. Now here's the deal. This is actually a pretty scary device because when you're running it on 12 volts, you're actually endangering the radio you know, for damage of this actual transmitting unit because of a voltage spike that could just destroy this equipment. So I'll show you how this 12 volt function works, but if I were you, I would always run this type of radio, the BC1335, on 6 volts if you have it available. And if you do have 12 volts, try and limit the current with, you know, a good power supply and a fuse. Because the way this system works, it, the radio itself actually runs on 6 volts. But if you input 12 volts and have this switch changed over, it actually just burns off the extra 12 volt, the extra 6 volts in heat. So that's the catch right here. There actually isn't really a good drop circuit or anything sophisticated like we have nowadays. It's just a basically a light bulb in there, and I'll show you that here in just a minute. So what we're going to do is go ahead and take off the cover, and I'll show you what I've done so far to get this thing back into service and what steps you might want to take to put this radio back into service if you happen to find one yourself. All right, so when we take a look inside this radio, you can see that there's actually quite a bit going on in there. We have a lot of these little small vacuum tubes all over the place, and we have some adjustments here for our frequency controls. And we also have a couple of larger vacuum tubes over here in the corner and some more back here that you can't see. I'll show you in a minute. There's a couple toggle switches here and there, some fuses, and then some other little can-style things I'll talk about and what we need to do to get one of these operational again. So, when you take a look, the first thing you'll notice is this big tube right here. Now, what this is is a missing tube that we had last time in the video. We couldn't figure out what it was. What this is, is a VR90 voltage regulator tube. So basically, it smooths out the voltage kind of as if a capacitor smooths out voltage in AC. However, this is a vacuum voltage regulator, so it operates on totally a different principle. So that tube is necessary to power radio, so we can always call those power tubes. And so that'll help us supply the voltage for the rest of the radio. And without that tube, we wouldn't be able to power anything, so that's why we had to replace that. We also have a couple transformers in these cans here and there. And then right here is a little device that I want to talk to you about. That is what they call a can vibrator. And what it does is it makes a square wave DC. So it simulates AC in a way. Because if you have a square wave on, off, on, off DC, then you can send that to the primary of these transformers in here. So what this thing has to do is oscillate at a given frequency 
and that will simulate alternating current throughout the radio because these transformers need to be powered by some source but typically you can't do that with DC so that's why they came up with this crude form of uh, somewhat of an inverter but it's basically just an oscillation device that creates a square wave in DC so one of the first things you're going to want to do when you get one of these radios is always check these vibrator cans because typically the goo they used inside there and the grease to lubricate the contacts typically have seized up after 70 years and when you turn this thing on you'll just get a buzzing noise or a bunch of smoke because it burns out being stuck. So just like any uh, mechanical device it's always a good idea to take it apart. So when you do just take yours out of your radio pull it straight up with a bit of pressure and these will come right out. As you can see it's just in a little metal can it's got a Bakelite base, and then this also is polarized because you have two pins that are larger diameter than all the rest, and that will always go towards the notch on the socket. So each socket for one of these little vibrator cans actually has a notch on it, like a little bitty bubble raised up, and that'll tell you the direction that these two larger pins will face. And fortunately for this radio, somebody has put a little notch in the side. If you can see right here, there's a little notch, and that always goes inward. On this particular model so whoever did that got tired of looking at the little deal and trying to line it up so the first thing you're gonna do when you take these apart is you'll have to gut the whole thing uncrimp it around the edge where it's crimped together and then pull the whole unit out and then get it going again now this particular one in the radio is a spare and this is the one here that'll be used so always check the operational one first to see if it works and then fortunately if you come across a BC 1335 like we have here you'll have a spare or at least we hope you'll have a spare in the radio now right behind this is the voltage drop circuit so if I remove this little can right here you can see the actual method of dropping the voltage to six volts it's just two lamps incandescent lamps like I mentioned before so we'll take a more in-depth look at that here in just a moment but I just wanted to start off by telling you that these guys give you a lot of trouble and unless you take it apart and clean it or maybe it works just right out of the deal like you got it but these will typically go bad after 70 years unless you can take it apart and fix it. So having that said, that'll be the number one cause of power issues in these radios. So before you ever turn it on, make sure that these little guys work. So aside from all these little can components that can go bad, you also have a voltage drop circuit, which is these two incandescent lamps right here. Now these two lamps actually take your 12 volts input voltage and reduce it down to 6 volts because like I mentioned before this radio is designed to operate at 6 volts DC however if you input a 12 volt DC power source it will just burn off the extra 6 volts in these two lamps and that will power your radio. Now there is a problem with running this radio in this manner you see if you lose one of these lamps or something shorts out you always run the risk of actually damaging the radio because if a short were to occur, you will get more voltage than specified on the radio, and you can always blow components up, especially these old capacitors and components that have gone bad, because a lot of these old resistors have gone way out of tolerance, and they need to be replaced, as well as the capacitors, which have a tendency to blow up, as a lot of my equipment has blown up on me, as well as friends I've seen and watched have seen their equipment blow up, all because of these old capacitors going bad. So to avoid such explosions, I'll tell you what you can do to get that out of the way so you can get one of these radios up and going again. Now while we're on the subject of power, I'll tell you about a fuse that's in this radio that may trip you up because half the time on old equipment that I've got, especially when it's been delivered or from eBay or something like that, usually the fuses are blown just because of damage and shipping. So right here on this radio, as you can see, there's a tiny little fuse right here. And fortunately, the one I picked up at Canton came with these fuses here so there's some extra ones in there now you'd always want to check inside the uh, the manual for this radio and make sure that these fuses are within the tolerance specified in the manual because you'd hate to have something too big and then burn up the rest of your radio and one more thing I apologize for the glare as you see all over this thing that's because this whole radio was coated in cosmoline and that's a weatherproof substance used to prevent rust on the metal and to keep this radio in good shape even in the harshest conditions so without further ado Let's talk about the crystal in the 6AF6G indicator tube that this radio possesses. Now as far as aligning radios, I particularly like this one because they put a 6AF6G indicator tube to help us do just that. And everything inside this radio is self-contained so you don't have to have any external oscilloscopes or anything like that when you want to make sure this radio is on channel. 
So as you can see, they have an easy switch right here for operation or to align the radio for startup procedures. So very easy configuration right here. And then as far as to aid us as visual aid, we have a 6 AF6G electric eye indicator tube. Now what that does is that will peak for maximum amplitude. So just like you would align a radio, you would hook up your oscilloscope and you would peak the radio for maximum amplitude. Well, for this radio, you do exactly that, except they have provided a little tube that will do just that. So when we turn the volume knob on, you can hear that click that will energize the radio and control this tube right here. Now the volume is the sensitivity for this 6AF6G. So based on the variable resistor settings on the front panel, we can get different readings on this tube. Now in order to align the radio on different frequencies for startup, we would turn the channel selector switch to A and we would pull out this little test prod. As you can see, they've provided it here. It has a wire attached to it. And we would put it in pin one, which is this far pin right here. You can barely see it right here, but this is pin one. You'd stick it in there, turn the switch to A, and then you would use these variable transformers along the side here, and you would tune this radio for peak noise or peak amplitude. And so you would see this tube would start to close up, so it would kind of close like that. That's what it looks like, except it's really bright green, except this tube's particularly bright, and that'll help you peak for maximum amplitude. And then for channel B, you would take the selector switch, move it over, and you would move this little prod to pin 2, for your second channel and you would do the same thing and then when you're ready you would move this pin out of its position into the holder here and you would set the radio's transmitter switch on right there and then you would move the radio to operate and you're all good to go and your radio is ready to transmit and of course before you are ready to talk you would just hold down the talk button on their microphone and you would uh, tune it one more time just to make sure that all of your frequencies and everything are set and your crystal is good to go so they made this radio particularly easy to operate because of this one little tube. So to show you this tube's operation, I've pulled it out of the radio and you can see it says 6AF6G right there, that's the number. Somebody labeled it bright when I bought it because it really is bright when you hook it up. So as you can see, there's the little bitty screen inside of there. So we're gonna go ahead and hook it up to this 177B tube tester and see what we can do. So in order to set this machine up, we're going to have to find our tube, which is a 6A of 6G indicator. And we're going to have to set the switches accordingly. So 3, 8, filament 6.3, and then our variable resistors are at 0. We'll put it in socket E and hit amplifier. So I've already got most of this set up for you. So we're going to zoom in on this electric eye indicator tube so you can see how it works. So we'll just follow the instructions, like I said, and we'll find 6A of 6G. We'll go 3. Then we'll go 8, 6.3, and then 0, 0, and there we go. The machine is now set up, and we'll heat the thing up, and we'll be good to go. All right, we now have our 6A of 6G warmed up. As you can see, the heating element in there is glowing red. So what we're going to do is go ahead and apply plate voltage to our transformer, and you can see that this tube will illuminate. So this is what I was talking about, not needing an oscilloscope, because this tube does just that for you. So if you'll notice on this side, see how it's open? That will indicate that your frequency is off or something is not right with your radio. Now, say that if we tune the radio and get it aligned, you will get a reading like this where it's closed. So you can see the, the brightest part right there has all closed up. So that's what we want. That'll indicate high amplitude. So if I switch it back, this will indicate low amplitude. As you can see, it's wide open. And then if we switch it again, you can see high amplitude. Now, as far as this test is concerned, the tube tester is just switching it from one side to another. But in reality, it would just be on this one side, and it would close up, as you see, how it's closed now. And then it would open when you're off-channel. So that's how this tube works. It's very interesting. So that's a visual piece of test equipment all in itself, and it's very tiny. It's about as big around as a quarter. So having something like that in these old radios is really interesting. Now we're going to move on to talk about the power supply and the antenna and what we're going to do to get this radio going as far as power is concerned and getting an antenna set up. To help you further understand the problem we're having with the BC1335, I brought you out here to an RT68 setup I have. And as you can see, we have an RT68 transmitter, an RT67 transmitter, and we also have their respective PP112GR power supplies that they use to supply the power to the radio. Now, for our BC1335, it's all we have is the radio. We don't have any of this other equipment. But for the RT68, as you can see, we have the, not only the transmitter, but we also have the power supply 
And not only do we have the power supply, we have the receiving unit, which can be found here, and we also have an amplifier unit to extend our range. So we have all the other equipment necessary to run this radio. And even to the degree as we have the crossover link power supply right here, so that'll cross over our power, and we even have the phone that you would use to talk on the radio. So you just squeeze to talk, there you go, got it pushed to transmit button right there, and then it plugs into the RT-68. Now, my point is, to show you this, is that this radio requires more than one piece of equipment to operate. You can't just have the transmitter and run it by itself. You see, that's the problem we're having on the BC-1335, is we have the transmitter, but we don't have the power supply. Now, the BC-1335 would have had a battery charger that straps on the bottom. It would have had two batteries that would power the radio, and it would also have an antenna switching box on top, and then it would have had the actual antenna mast. Now, for these radios, they're a little different because if you take a look right here, the antenna just uses a little coax jack, and you can just plug into there, screw it, and out with the antenna. Very simple to operate. And the phone just plugs in right here. It's got a very special Amphenol connector, but don't worry about that. The BC-1335 doesn't have anything like that. Now, for our 1335, we need an MP47 mount, antenna mount, that we don't have, so we're going to have to improvise that. And we don't have any power supply for our 1335. We don't have anything. We don't even have an amplifier. We don't have the phone. We don't have a lot of equipment, but we're going to make do with what we got. So that is the issue that we're having as far as power is concerned and an antenna, because we typically need a three-mast field antenna to run this radio. Now, without further ado, we'll just talk about the rest of the actual circuitry and take the radio apart on the backside and see what needs to be done as far as capacitors and other components. So I know a lot of you guys have wanted to see the back side of this radio, so what I've done was remove the bottom cover so you can see the internal components that make this radio operate. Now one of the first things you'll notice when you take a look inside is how neatly the wiring harness is done here. As you can see, everything together is tied up with this cloth wire. You see, you won't find that kind of work nowadays on anything. This was something that you typically used in World War II on all these old transmitters. Now this wire is particularly interesting because it's this old braided cloth wire, as opposed to the rubber insulation that we're so used to today. So if you'll notice, this braided wire is not decayed anywhere. You can look all over the radio and you'll find that it's all pretty much intact, except for where the case has been, you know, applied pressure. But then again, the wire is still intact, it's not damaged. Now oftentimes on these old radios, you'll find rubber insulation that has just totally cracked, fallen off, and then... You have exposed wires potentially touching the case or ground, and then you get a nice little mushroom cloud whenever you turn on the radio. But to avoid that, I typically love radios that have been using this cloth wire because it decays much slower than typical rubber insulation. And not to mention just how neat it looks when they tie everything up like this to get the wire away from all the other components. You see, this kind of neat work you won't find today. Now let's talk about some of the components that can be found in this radio. One thing about this BC-1335 that I like among all the others is that the capacitors they chose were very much different than all the rest. You see, a lot of um, equipment that I have, like test equipment, they use these old electrolytic capacitors for the power and filter, and then they use these wax paper capacitors. Oh boy, those are the enemy of old radios. However, this radio was very clever and they used mica capacitors, like this one here, like this one here, like that one there. They're all mica capacitors, you know, and these capacitors are known for their reliability and their stability under heat and pressure and all these kind of things. You see, when this radio is being kicked around, thrown around, and, you know, very hot, like these old right here, you can see the capacitors. These mica capacitors typically won't go bad on you. However, the old wax paper ones, once the electrolytic inside of there has dried out of the old electrolytics and once the paper decays and everything else, they tend to become more like a resistor or they pass AC, they short out and blah 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 and these capacitors just go bad. However, we're very fortunate in this case to have used mica capacitors because typically they'll be alright and we won't have to change them out. So again, we're going to go ahead and test all these capacitors and test various components like resistors to make sure they're within tolerance. But I would not worry if I were you, if you pick one of these up and you see a bunch of mica capacitors, hardly ever do they go bad. However, there are times they do, but for the most part, you should be okay as far as capacitors are concerned. Now here we have some variable capacitors. As you can see, our potato slicers are found here. And then we have a bunch of resistors way down inside here on the top. 
Now, if I were you, one thing I would always do is just clean up all the tube sockets, you know, make sure all the contacts are clean before you turn the thing on. Take a little bit of contact cleaner, spray in there, plug in a tube, you know, several times just to make sure it's clean. And I would always do that with the volume potentiometer as well. Now, right here is the special part. Right here, almost out of the frame, is where we're going to be hooking our antenna. Because we have an emergency antenna port. As you can see, there's a coil wire right through wrapped around a ceramic. So instead of using that great big old huge ceramic disc that they've provided right here, we're going to use the separate antenna jack and use a piece of wire. Because as stated in the manual, when we don't have the right antenna or when we don't have the right components, we can use a 27 foot long piece of wire. And I believe in the manual the wire was W29, but since we don't have that fancy military wire, we'll just use what we have laying around and that should work fine. So also I'm getting licensed to operate this unit on the ham frequency, so we'll be getting crystals to match that frequency range. Now I'm going to go ahead and take the camera and pan you down so you can see the other half of this radio, and then we'll talk about that section next. So now you can kind of see the other half of that radio that was covered up by the camera, and you can see that there really isn't much to see, just a bunch of big capacitors right here and then a few wire wound resistors. Now on this radio you can notice that this wire wound resistor coated in ceramic and of course cosmoline has been exposed to a tremendous amount of heat that's why we get this discoloration so there's there can be several causes for heat on resistors like that typically they run hot anyways but sometimes if something is shorting out or you have a problem like that you'll get a lot of excessive heat in some of your components so it's always a good idea to keep an eye on the temperatures of various components and this is a good sign that something could possibly be wrong but I have a feeling it's more likely just the cosmoline that they coated this with. Its chemical formula probably changed as a result of the heat, which led to discoloration. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. Here's some more capacitors, and I always have a habit of just shorting everything out. Not that this radio has even been in service for probably 50 years, but you know me. We just have a big capacitor, some more little cloth wires in the back. And that's really all that makes up this radio. There's a tube socket right under here, so if we need to get to any of that, I'll make a note of where that is located. We also have another part of the antenna circuit because there's a place, a little coax jack for our emergency antenna because, like I said, as stated in the manual, we can run out a wire as opposed to the uh, typical three-masted field antenna. So that pretty much gives you an overview of the bottom side of this radio. So you can see all of the components and everything that runs the radio, and then uh, that should be it for the bottom side. So before we conclude this video, I wanted to show you one more thing we've got for the SRC619 radio set. And that is this little T17B microphone. So it's a little microphone, it's got a push to talk switch right there, and that'll work for our BC1335. It's got a PL68 plug, one of these special plugs. It's a little bit smaller than a quarter inch jack, but that'll work for our radio. We've also got the microphone for the RT68 setup, so stay tuned for getting this unit working. And we'll also be doing some work on these oscilloscopes right here, like the ANUSM24C. Another thing, we'll be transitioning our channel to filming on a World War II destroyer escort, the USS Stewart, DE-238. So stay tuned for that. We'll be filming a lot of equipment on that ship, like running the engines. We'll be running some big generators and a lot of huge electrical distribution equipment. We'll also be doing transmitters, gyroscopes, and all kinds of... Everything you find on a World War II destroyer escort ship will be taking a look at. So we'll definitely be filming in the Combat Information Center and other rooms like the radio room. So stay tuned if you like that World War II equipment. And once again, thank you for watching this video. This is High Voltage Mayhem, and I'll see you guys later.